get started. We're going live. What is up, everybody? We're going super, super live for live stream number 115. I can't believe how deep in the game we are at this point. Uh, very, very nice to be here, as usual, with our amazing community. Thank you all for coming, for attending, for being a part of the Data on Kubernetes community. We love you all very much. A couple of things before we get started, all right? Just a couple of little housekeeping things, things we want to keep in mind. Very important, all right? Our, one of the things that makes our community unique is that we are the only, we have the industries, the only, the leading and only industry report about data on Kubernetes. If you haven't checked that out yet, I highly recommend doing so. I'm gonna drop the link here in the YouTube chat. So you can check that out. We got lots of good insights. These are gonna make the internal conversations in your organizations more fluid because we interviewed over 500 different practitioners, uh, C-suite folks, all different, a wide variety of data on Kubernetes stakeholders to hear from them just what's going on, the value that we can get from this. And we'll be taking that further with a panel that we have tomorrow, talking about the business side of DOK. You can expect more content about that coming out as well too. So we see both the technical and the business side. And other things that are coming up, uh, I was telling John before we got started, is you should know already that our CFP for KubeCon in May is open. Um, we're looking for talks. We hope to have two tracks um, in this KubeCon instead of the one track that we've done in the last two, because we've got so much stuff to talk about that we really want to give everybody enough time to do so. Check out the CFP, pretty straightforward, very clear guidelines, no vendor pitches, all right? We want technical content for a technical audience driving these conversations forward. Um, that being said, the person who will be driving the conversation forward today is John Pruitt, who's joining us from Birmingham, Alabama. Big shout out to him. Big shout out to all the wonderful folks at Timescale. I am so such a fan of Lorraine, who Lorraine does community stuff at Timescale, that I tagged her instead of Timescale as a company. Lorraine has a very cool Twitter handle, which is Atomic Mutton. I would like to work at a company named Atomic Mutton if anybody wants to start one. But today we're focused here with, uh, with John. John, very nice to have you with us. Before we get into what we're talking about today, you are a, an SQL lover, fan, also Postgres. Can you just tell us a little bit about that journey and what made you, you know, get attracted to, to, to both these technologies? Sure. Um, so, you, you know, like a lot of people, I took an elective on databases in college, but uh, you only learn like a tiny little bit of what's there. Uh, but a year out of college, I was given a project working on encrypted medical documents stored in a database on a CD-ROM. And so I was kind of like thrown in the deep end with, with databases very early in my career. And, uh, you know, if, and it was interesting and cool. And um, spent a lot of time working on custom time series applications on relational databases in the power industry. I did a, a few years as a data architect at a bank working in data warehousing. And in those few years, pretty much only worked with SQL. And um, being forced to work with a single technology, you start to learn um, how to do big things with it, right? And so I, I fell in love with SQL and databases in general. Um, there, unfortunately, it was Oracle. Um, <laughs> we may have some more. We may have some Oracle folks in the audience, <laughs> and we forgive them too. Yeah. Yes, uh, I've worked with Oracle and SQL Server and Sybase and Postgres, and they're all wonderful technologies. But um, a year or two later, I, I started a side business using Postgres, and that's when I really, really fell in love with with Postgres specifically. Um, and the thing just, is, we've got quite a few Postgres fans in our community. What is it about Postgres, apart from the lovely elephant logo and all that kind of stuff, what is it that makes people fall in love with it so much? Uh, I think it's a number of things. I think it's, for one thing, it's mature. It's been around forever. Mm, battle tested. Um, so it's true. battle tested. It's bulletproof. Yeah. The documentation is excellent. I don't know if you've ever looked at the Postgres docs, but um, I think if you print it out, it's something like 2,500 pages. I mean... You can just go read the docs, and uh, if you've ever had to look at, at at the docs for like Sybase or or Oracle, it's it's really hard to find what you're looking for, and um, you know Postgres is it's it's easier to learn, and you know you can you can boot Postgres up on ra a Raspberry Pi, you know, so it's very easy to get started. It's very easy to learn. Um, I think the developer experience is excellent. You know, you look at at Say you're working with SQL Server, you, you want this database function that's not there. It's in Oracle, but Oracle doesn't have the one that SQL Server has. Well, you look at Postgres and it's got both. Um, so um, 
yeah, that's it's it's just a pleasure to work with. Um, I think. Very very good. That being said, yeah. if you want to jump into your presentation and get right in and start learning about open telemetry. Sure, uh, I'm going to share my screen. All right. All right. So right. my my talk is entitled uh, "What More Can I Learn from My Open Telemetry Traces?" Um, I'm an engineer at Timescale, and I work on the observability team with um, several engineers, including Matt, who's done a talk with you before on yes. Prometheus and PromScale, which is a, the product that we're working on. It's an open source product. And uh, I, I don't know if I've told Matt this, but uh, I looked at his, I watched his talk with you in the interview process at Timescale, and it was excellent interview prep. So I definitely recommend that we're, we're hiring, go watch his talk. Um, but everything I'm doing in this talk does not, none of it requires time scale or, or prom scale. Um, yeah. So um, here's what we're going to cover. First, we're going to do some context. We're going to talk about what tracing is, make sure we're all on the same page. Then I've got an example system that uh, it's a very simple kind of um, absurd little password generator that generates traces and, and creates a, a playground for us to explore tracing with. And then we're gonna show some Grafana dashboards that are built using this, um, this example system using SQL. All of this uh, is in an, a repo, a public repo, uh, open telemetry demo on GitHub. Um, so you can pull the system down it runs in Docker Compose. Uh, there's a, like a run shell script with one command. It's all up and running. It's got um, Grafana and Jaeger in it. So it's, it's there for you to play with. So tracing. Uh, if you've ever debugged an error, uh, you've probably seen a stack trace. And so a stack trace uh, shows you the path of execution backwards from where the error happened up to the main function. So you can see how you got to the error, right? And so when we're talking about tracing, it's a very similar concept to a stack trace. You're, a trace is usually associated with a request coming into a system. And then it follows the path of execution that was taken to fulfill that request. And this may be within a single service, you know, following function calls, and it may uh, typically follows calls into other services. So you can trace it not just within one process, but across a whole series of microservices. And so a trace is really um, a map of that path of execution uh, for a single request across all of these systems. Oh, and so and we, so we got a request. Yeah. Um, can I get the, that link in the chat to the repo? Yes. Yeah, if you just drop it in here in the Zoom call, then I'll then I'll pass it over. Also, I'm going to take advantage to because uh, since John mentioned, I'm going to drop the link here in the chat um, for the talk that he watched that helped him prepare um, for his time scale interview. Yes. Um, so we got that there. Definitely check that out. Matt was a great great guest. Um, wonderful wonderful talk. And we got oops, sorry, dropped the same thing twice. Sorry about that. I'm going to copy and paste that repo. You're all good to go. Keep going. Cool. Yeah, so uh, first of all, a trace is a, is a tree structure, right? It's a tree of spans. And a span is a chunk of code that was executed, right? Uh, I like to think of them as functions, but they don't necessarily have to be a function. It's a chunk of code that has a start time and an end time, and that code was executed. A span can also have children. Um, so if you think of like, you're in a function, you're doing some work, and then you call another function. It does some work and then returns and you do some more work. That, that call to another function would be a child span. And so children can have children, can have children, and you get a tree, right? Um, a trace is also a time series. So I mentioned that each span has a start and end time. Uh, so really, when you, th when you think about tracing, you have to keep those two dimensions in mind. One is the tree structure and one is the time series. Uh, and each span, um, its start and end time encompasses all of its children. Any questions? That's a really quick uh, high level intro to tracing. So open tracing or open telemetry is a CNCF project um, that standardizing uh, traces, logs and metrics. 
And for about the six, last six months, I've been working with um, you know, members of my team on adding tracing support to PromScale. And you know, PromScale is backed by TimeScale DB, which is um, you know, an extension on top of Postgres. So this whole talk is about shoving traces into a relational database and then trying to get value out of it. So this is a tool called Jaeger. It's open source. It's, um, it's specifically for looking at traces. And um, my understanding and my, my gut feeling about how traces are used today is you've got a system, it's instrumented with metrics, it's instrumented with logs, it's instrumented with traces. You've probably got some dashboards that use metrics and some alarms on those dashboards. Uh, let's say an alarm goes off, you get paged, you go look at your dashboards, you try and um, see what's going on, you get the time period for what's, uh, uh, what's happening. You go dig around in the logs for that time period. You, you hopefully can isolate some messages that look like they may be correlated with the problem. And hopefully those logs have trace IDs in them. You grab a sample of the trace IDs, you head over to Jaeger, and you look at these traces individually, hoping that they shed some light on the problem. So I think um, the state of the art right now is really looking at traces individually. And um, what I'm gonna show you is um, a way to look at those in aggregate and, and talk about the kind of power that that brings. So this is really, uh, this talk is really set up as a tutorial. We'll start with some basic SQL and some basic dashboards that are kind of uninter uninteresting and work up to this final dashboard where you can see a real-time map of the entire system and sort of pinpoint your performance problems. And, um, and I'll show you the SQL along the way. So this is the, uh, a diagram of the system that we're gonna be playing with. It's again, absurd. I wouldn't, nobody in their right mind would build a password generator this way, but it's, a, it's an easy way to make some example traces. We've got four services, upper, lower digit and special that serve up a random character of that type. And then a generator service that uses those service to construct a random password. We've got a load script that's just continuously asking for a password to exercise the system. And all of these services are instrumented with open telemetry libraries and sending traces to an open telemetry collector that forwards the traces to the PromScale collector and on into the PromScale database. What's not shown here is the, the system also comes with Grafana and Jaeger. So in this talk, I'm gonna focus um, almost exclusively on a single view in our database called the span view. Um, and we're only gonna look at uh, a subset of the columns in that view. So suffice to say that this is just scratching the surface of what you can do with um, tracing in a SQL database. Um, but yeah, what you can do with just this is really powerful. So in the span view, we have a trace ID. All of the spans in a given trace will have the same trace ID, but each span will have their own unique span ID. A child span will have the span ID of its parent. So between the span ID and the parent span ID, this is how we um, construct the tree structure. We have a service name and a span name. You can think of this as obviously the service name is the service. The span name you could think of as the function name or the operation. We have the start and end time. So now we're getting into the time series aspect and the duration, which is just end time minus start time and a status code, which we're gonna use to look for um, spans that have, um, have an error associated with them. So really, you know, like two, four, six, eight, nine, nine columns, very simple. All right, I'm gonna get out of the presentation and do some live stuff. So this is Jaeger, uh, just to reiterate where I think the state of the art is right now. We're looking at, at a single trace. Uh, you can see at the top here, what's, uh, it's a timeline like a Gantt chart. Um, you can see on the left side, the tree structure. So you see this nesting of spans. 
And then over to the right, you can see the start and end times and durations illustrated. And so this is a, a, a single trace. It's got 136 spans in it at a maximum depth of nine in the tree structure. It's uh, involving five different services and the total duration is 1.99 seconds. So this system has performance problems. It's I've, I've put some Easter eggs in it to make it slower and to generate some errors uh, to make it to, to make these graphs interesting. If I didn't do that, they would all be uh, pretty boring to look at. And also, so you can you can use these dashboards to dig around and try to find those problems, and then you can go comment out these Easter eggs and see how the the dashboards change. So this is what you get in Jaeger, uh, and now we're going to show the uh, dashboards in Grafana that we built. So again, we're gonna start with some simple ones that are not super interesting and work our way up to more interesting ones. This one is looking at request rates. And um, I should also say, we're only using tracing. There, there's no metrics instrumented in the system. There's no logging instrument in, in the system. All of this is done purely with tracing. So right here we see uh, one minute requests per second averages. So, uh, you know, in this minute here, we were seeing almost four requests per second. So clearly this is a, this thing has some performance problems, right? Uh, and we're doing this in the last 30 minutes. Then down in the bottom one, we've got the same data, but we're doing it uh, in one second buckets. So for each second, we're seeing how many requests were fulfilled in that second. So this one's averaged and this one's not. And just to show you that I'm not pulling one over on you, you can go in here and you can see that we've got SQL backing these graphs tied to a prom scale database. But this is it's hard to look at in here, so we're gonna look at it in VS Code. All right, so this is the, the top graph that we showed you. We're looking at the span view. We're filtering on the start time. And we're looking where the parent span ID is null. So remember I said uh, each parent span start and end time encompasses all of its children. Well, the, the root span in a trace has no parent span, right? So where parent span ID mean, uh, where parent span ID is null means find me the root in each trace. And because it's start and end encompasses all the children, we know that its duration is the full duration taken to serve that request. So by, um, by looking at the span time for a time when at the span view for a time window and only getting the root spans, we're seeing all of the requests in that time and getting their request durations. So we're going to take all of those base, all of those traces, and we're going to bucket them into one-minute buckets. And this is using a time scale DB function called time bucket. You could do it with date trunk, which is a, a standard SQL function, but time bucket is uh, more flexible, more powerful. So this is just saying, you know, sort these things into one one-minute time buckets, count the number of spans or the number of traces in that time bucket, and divide it by sixty to get a request per second. So this is, you know, less than 10 lines of code and that generates this graph right here. So again, we're looking at um, many, many traces instead of just one. We're looking at the last 30 minutes, all the traces we've got in the last 30 minutes. For the bottom one, it's basically the same thing, except we're bucketing by one second uh, in one second buckets instead of one minute buckets. And we're not having to divide by zero in that case. And this is to show you that uh, Grafana actually has a macro that you use that can tie the time filtering to the time picker in the UI. So that's what this time filter is. We've just replaced this hard-coded time filtering logic with this macro. All right, so again, what you're probably saying is, uh, that's not very impressive. I've already got graphs exactly like this that are backed by metrics. Um, 
and that's a very fair point, uh, but we're just getting warmed up. So let's look at the next one. And this one, we're looking at error rates. So in this part, pie chart over here, we're looking at the last 30 minutes. We're finding all of the spans that had an error indicated on them, and we're grouping them by the service. And we can see that the upper service had 120, 112 errors. The special service had 36, and that represents 76 for the upper, 76% of the errors were seen in the upper service and 24% of the errors were seen in the special service. Um, and again, this is like real, this is real time data. As the time window changes, this, these values may change, um, generated strictly by traces. In the table here, we get the same data, only instead of rolled up to the service level, we've drilled down one level into the operation or the span name, which you know sort of corresponds to a function. And we're seeing the error rate over here. So we can we can see, you know, our biggest problem as far as error goes, errors go, is this extra extra process upper function. So if we want to go, you know, make this go down, we need to go look over there. And then finally, on this the dashboard, we've got the same uh, information plotted as a line graph. So this is for each operation and the system, the error rate as it changes over time. So let's look at the SQL for this. So for the pie chart, this is actually simpler SQL than we saw on the last uh, dashboard. We're looking at the span view, we're filtering by time, and we're only looking at spans where the status code indicates that there was an error. We're grouping by service and counting those um, instances of error. Um, you know, this is again less than 10 lines of code, and it gets you this pie chart. For the table, we're getting a little bit more complicated. We're looking at the span view, filtering by time. We're going to group by the service name and the span name, which can be the, you know, the operation of the function name. We're going to get the total number of executions by counting them. But we're also going to get a count where the status code is error. And having those two counts, we can divide them and get the error rate. That gives us this table here. And finally, for the time series graph at the bottom, we're going to take the same query that we had before. And instead of looking at the entire 15 minute time window, we're going to break it down into time buckets of one minute. Uh, so really, the only addition is this time bucket here, uh, referencing it in the outer query and ordering it by time. So again, you know, like less than 50 lines of code, we can see error rates by service, error rates by operation, error rates by operation over time, strictly using tracing data. Now, we'll get a little bit more complicated, a little bit more interesting. Now we're gonna look at request durations. Um, this first one is a heat map over time of request durations. Uh, so each of these buckets will show you at this time how many uh, requests were served that took this amount of time to serve. I hope I said that in a way that was <laughs> easy to understand. So for instance, this box right here says there were 90 requests served in this time bucket that took between 256 milliseconds and 512 milliseconds. And you can see already that with this data, you, you can observe a pattern. It's, it's kind of cyclical here. And there's an Easter egg in the code that makes that happen that you can go find. So that's this graph down here is essentially the same data, only plotted using um, lines instead of a heat map. And we are plotting the P0, P50, P75, P90, P95, and P99 request um, 
durations over time. So again, you can see that cyclical pattern. The top right, we have a histogram of request durations. So we're seeing for this entire 15 minute time period, we're looking at all of the, the requests, all of the traces and bucketing them by how much time they took. So most of them are taking, um, you know, less time, but we're seeing some that are taking, you know, 28, 29 seconds up here. Um, so clearly we have performance problems to find. And finally in the top, uh, the bottom right, we've got a table showing us the top 10 slowest traces in this 15 minute time window, right? And these are the trace IDs. So you could take this trace ID and we should be able to go over to like Jaeger and look it up. And so this was the trace. It took, you know, nearly 30 seconds. All right, so let's look at the SQL behind this. For the heat map, we're gonna look at that span view again, filter by time. Again, only look at the ones where the parent is null. So these are the root spans and just take the time and the duration. And the Grafana widget is actually doing the hard work of generating the heat map. For the histogram, we're going to do an even simpler query. We're again, looking at only the root spans and we're just taking all of the durations, the distinct durations that we're seeing and Grafana puts it, plots it on a histogram. Now to draw the line graph where we had the percentiles, it gets a little more complicated. Um, we're gonna look at the span view, filter it by time, only look at the root spans, bucket that into one minute buckets and grab the duration. Then we're gonna cross join this. So these are the uh, percentiles that we want to draw. So one percentile, five, uh, 50, 75, 90, 95, and 99. By cross joining these two, we're taking all of the observations, all the samples and all of the percentiles we want to, to uh, plot. And we're using percentile ag and a prox percentile to um, actually draw the line, right? So this is a little bit more complicated stuff, but it's still fairly simple. Um, the percentile ag and a prox percentile are functions from the Timescale DB toolkit. Um, they are efficient. Um, you can do them with standard database functions like uh, percentile continuous, stuff like that. Uh, so there's definitely not a barrier to doing this without time scale. So this, this query generates this graph right here. And finally, for the table, we are looking at the same view, filtering by time, looking at the root spans, uh, and just ordering by duration and limiting 10. If you order by duration descending, you're going to get start with the slowest ones, and we're just going to get 10 of them. All right, so, so far, we haven't really looked at the tree structure of the trace yet. Um, and if you don't look at the tree structure, you're really you know, limiting yourself on the value you can get. So we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna dip our toe into the tree structure now and look at service dependencies. So this dashboard is looking at the last five minutes. It's looking at every trace in the last five minutes. And it's building a real-time dynamically generated service dependency map using those traces. So it's identifying all of the distinct services represented in the trace data and all of the dependencies, all of the distinct dependencies between those services. And not just the dependencies between the services, but the dependencies between API endpoints in the services. So these, Services are really simple. They're only listening on the root, you know, the forward slash HTTP path. So I only have one arrow incoming to each service. But, you know, a typical service would have dozens or hundreds of endpoints it's listening on. And um, in that case, you would have an arrow for each one. So incredibly powerful. 
the numbers on these arrows are the actual number of calls along that path that happened in this five minute window. So generator service called the lower services um, forward slash endpoint 492 times in the last five minutes. So already uh, this is uncovering an Easter egg that I have. There's absolutely no point for the lower service to be calling the digit service. That's just thrown in there uh, as a purposeful bug to uncover and find. If we were to go track down that one liner that makes this call and comment it out, as this time window slides past, this arrow would disappear. And so again, this is not uh, based on any documentation. It is real time dynamically generated from tracing data. Over here on the right, we've got the same information uh, in tabular form um, with the addition of the total execution time spent in the last five minutes on each of these um, arrows and the average execution time for each arrow. All right, so prepare for the SQL. It's gonna be a little bit more complicated. So again, we're, we're dealing with the tree structure now of each trace. And if you've ever dealt with uh, you know, trees in code, you've probably used recursion. Um, and we're, we're not having to get in that yet because we're only looking at um, pairs of spans instead of the entire tree, but we'll get there. Uh, we're using a standard Grafana widget called the node graph for this. And uh, it actually takes two queries to draw, one query to return the distinct nodes and one query to uh, identify the distinct arrows. So I'm cheating a little bit. This is one instance where I'm not using the view we've been using before. I'm doing this strictly for performance reasons. I'm just grabbing a list of the distinct service names in the database. We could pull that out of the span view, but uh, I chose not to. For the edges, uh, Grafana wants to know an ID to uniquely identify each edge, the source, an ID for the source, so you, and the target. So you got to know uh, that I have an edge and where it comes from and where it goes to in the graph. So what we're doing is we're using the span view twice, once alias as parent and once alias as kid. We want to look at these pairs where they're in the same trace and the parent's span ID is the kid's parent span ID. So there's a direct relationship between the two. And crucially, we wanna look where the parent's service name is not the same as the kid's service name. So that's how we know this isn't a function call within a service, it is actually a network hop, a call between two services. And we're filtering on time and generating these IDs. The count is the number of executions observed. So this, this identifies um, all the edges and this graph right here. For the table, we're gonna take that same query we just looked at. And the only thing we're gonna add is the sum of the durations and the average of the durations um, to get those columns in the table. So again, this is you know less than 40 lines of code, uh, taking out the blank lines and the comments, and we're we're generating a, a real-time mini map of the uh, dependencies between our services. So how how would this be useful? I mean, right here we're seeing this dependency that shouldn't be there, right? This um, it's not dependent on any documentation. It's uh, real-time um, insights. All right, now we're gonna get into some recursion. Um, this dashboard is called upstream spans. So you, you think about a tree, grab a, a span in that trace tree. You can either walk the tree up or walk the tree down. If you go up the tree, you're saying a lot like a stack trace, who called me, who called them, who called them, right? All the way up to the entry point into the system. 
And that's what this uh, graph is doing. So we can go over here and this is looking at the last 15 minutes. We can pick, um, let's say the digit service and we'll look at a function called process digit. And so this is looking at um, all of the traces where process digit uh, was observed in the tree in the last 15 minutes. In each of those traces, walking the tree structure up, finding the distinct set of spans that were observed in those traces in that path and the distinct edges and building us this picture. So we can see in the last 15 minutes, there's actually two ways that process digit is getting called. Requests enter the system over here in the generator service, and they can either follow this path where generator calls the digit surges service directly, or where the generator service calls the lower digit, uh, the lower service, and then the lower service calls the digit service, right? Um, so again, if we go back to this service dependencies uh, graph, we're seeing this path and this path in greater detail. So again, like what's the use case here? Let's say you're, you, are, you own a service, you're seeing some uh, alarm goes off, you're seeing all kinds of uh, new volume of requests. You don't know what's happening. Nobody gave you a heads up. You need to know where is this traffic coming from? Go in here, you find your service and it'll show you all the different ways people are, are uh, requests are entering the system and coming to your service. So maybe, you know, this lower service added dependency and never gave you a heads up about it. You, you can see it right here and, um, you know, then go talk to those folks about what's going on. So let's look at the, the SQL behind that. So again, uh, we're using that standard widget. We have to have two queries, one for the nodes, one for the edges. Um, again, because we're dealing with a tree structure, we're going to use recursion. And thankfully, you can use uh, recursion in SQL. Uh, you use something called a common table expression with this recursive um, modifier on it. And the way this works is there, there are two queries in a recursive query, right? The first one, the top one, is the initial query. So it's, it's the starting place. And then the second one is the iterative uh, query. So the first query runs and the results of that get fed into the second and the results of that get fed into the second and the results of that get fed into the second until there are no more results. And that's, that's the recursion. So what we've got here is the span view filtered by time that we've selected, uh, filtered by the service we've picked, filtered by the operation we picked. And that gives us, identifies all the spans in the time period that match our selection. Then we go down to this next iteration and our previous iteration is aliased as X. So we look at all of the spans where we're in the same trace as the previous iteration. And the previous iteration's parent is this iteration's ID. So we're walking up the tree. And we keep doing that. We keep walking up the tree until we get to the root node of the trace and there's no parent ID and there's no further recursion uh, to happen. And we take all of those spans, we group by service name and span name, and we generate a unique identifier for that node and account as the um, statistic. So that query gives us all of these nodes, the distinct nodes in the last 15 minutes. And again, we're looking at thousands of uh, traces to generate this picture. For the edges, we'll take that same recursive query, but for an edge, remember we have to identify both the start and the end of the arrow, right? So on the first iteration, we actually don't have enough information to identify um, an arrow because we only have the starting point. So we'll start out with null for these three fields that Grafana needs. On the second iteration, we now have 
the prior iteration and this iteration. So we have a source and a target and we can identify an arrow. So we'll use the service name and span name of the source and the service name and the span name of the target to generate a unique ID for that edge and uh, also the unique ID for the two nodes at the start and end. And then finally, we're gonna throw out that first iteration where we didn't have enough info to make an edge and get a distinct set of those arrows. So hopefully you followed that. It's a little more complicated, but it's still not a lot of code, right? We're talking less than hundred lines of code uh, to generate this, um, this graph that's looking at thousands of traces in real time to build you a picture of what's happening in your system. All right, now I'm gonna look at the opposite. So this is the last uh, dashboard we've got. It's meant to be the most impressive. Hopefully that rings true. Uh, in the previous one, we looked upstream of the span. Now we're gonna look downstream. So right now we've got generator forward slash picked. That happens to be the entry point into the system. So this uh, node graph here is showing you all of the distinct operations and calls that were executed in the last 15 minutes in the system. Everything that happened in the last 15 minutes is represented in this graph. And again, like this is, this is the whole system, so it's a little bit hard to grok, but you can dynamically drill down. So if we go to the lower service, it you know, becomes a little bit simpler to look at. We go down to like the digit service, um, now, now we're, we can really understand what's happening. You know, a, a request comes into the digit service, it calls one function, then it calls another function, then it calls another function, what happens, call another function, and it returns. So we'll drill back out to the full wide view. So now down here, we have a pie chart. What this pie chart represents is the amount of execution time that was spent at each of these operations in the last 15 minutes. This is incredibly powerful. So we can see from this pie chart right here that this random digit function in the digit service spent 29 minutes of execution time in the last 15 minutes, right? Representing 86% of the total execution time in the system. So imagine you're trying to make the lower service faster. We'll drill down to the lower service. It's gonna update this graph, got the little spinny. Um, what this is telling us is that if we wanna make the lower service faster, we, we actually don't even need to look at the lower service. The lower service is calling the digit service and the digit service makes up 88% of our runtime. So if we wanna make the lower service faster, we actually need to go look at the digit service and we know exactly which function to look at, this random digit function. Uh, so hugely powerful. Over here on the right, we've got a different representation of the same data. So this pie chart is, is looking at the aggregate for the entire 15 minutes. This line graph is showing us the same data, but instead of for the whole 15 minutes, we're doing it in 15 second, um, buckets. So you can see how the execution uh, time changes over time. And then finally, at the bottom, we've got the same information in tabular form. We've got the total execution time, the P50, P95, and P99 execution times for that function. So if we look at the SQL here, unsurprisingly, we're going to use recursion again. For the top node graph, we, we need the two queries, one for the node, one for the edges. This is the same recursive query that we used in the previous dashboard. The only difference is we've swapped this relationship. So instead of, you know, the parent span ID was over here and span ID was over here, we just reversed them. And now we're walking down the tree instead of up the tree. So again, these, these two queries are exactly the same from the previous dashboard, just with those, that one edit. 
For the pie chart, we're going to use the same recursive query as before, but now we're, we're calculating duration. So if you'll remember, uh, earlier I said each, each span has uh, a start and end time that includes the times of all of the children, right? So if we want to know how much time is spent in a given span itself, exclusive of its children, we need to subtract the, the sum of the direct children's, right? So if I spend, uh, if my span is five seconds, but I called two functions that each took one second each, I spent three seconds myself executing and the other two functions spent two seconds, right? So that's what we're doing here. We've got a given span S, here's its duration. We're gonna go find all of the, the spans where they're in the same trace and S is the parent. So these are, this is Z will be the direct children. And we're gonna sum the durations of those direct children and subtract them from this span. That may be the most complicated part of all of this. But we do that and then it becomes easy. You just sum the duration and you get that nice pie graph. So that's what drives this. And that's how we know you know, random digit is spending 18 minutes and it's not, that's not inclusive of any functions that random digit might call itself. All right, for the time series graph, where we take the pie chart and we draw it as a line graph over time, we're gonna use the same query. The only thing we've added is this time bucket. So instead of looking at, at results that represent the entire 15 minute window, we're looking at 15 second buckets. And we have to produce those bucket, those times of the buckets in the output and uh, order by them. That gives us this right here. And finally, for the table, we've got the same query as before. The only thing we've added is, are these three um, extra columns where we are doing percentile calculations to get P50, P95, and P99. All right. That was a whirlwind of um, dashboards and SQL. Um, what kind of questions do we have? Well, we're just getting wonderful feedback from the audience. Uh, someone mentioned impressive general. Uh, uh, yeah, here we go. Can't wait to try this on our system. Now, with that being said, when folks are thinking about, you know, trying this for the first time, what kind of, what approach did you use and how would you recommend, um, you know, having, having gotten into this, and obviously this video is a great resource, but are there any things you would say like, hey, watch out for this, be careful of that before you get involved, make sure you check out, I don't know what it might be. Any advice you would give in that regard? Um, yeah, so there is a website for open telemetry um oh yeah i share i shared that link earlier yeah okay cool but, but no but that's good that's a good resource <laughs> that's good to know right uh so you know they've got documentation where you can go read about the, conceptually what traces are you can you can look at the spec and see exactly what these data data elements mean and we've tried to you know correlate the specs names with what we use in the database um, there's also you know, APIs and SDKs, libraries for you know, a lot of the popular languages that you can just pull down and start using. It was very simple um, to add tracing to these. You know, I wrote this in Python, so uh, it was really pretty simple to use to start generating traces. And um, you know, what I did was build this little playground app. I made it simple enough that I could understand what was going on, but but complex enough to generate some meaningful, interesting traces to, to play around with. So I would say pull down this repo, this demo and um, play with it. You know, you can, you can run it in Docker Compose. Mm -hmm. You can go hack on the, the code. Each of these services is just one Python script. So it's, it's really um, meant to be easy to, to digest and to play with. So um, yeah, and then go look at the database, query around. Uh, look at the uh, Grafana dashboards and the SQL behind it. And, and yeah, I, I just play with it. 
Yeah. <laughs> that's what no, I no, did. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, to take it a little bit further, right. You know, cause we, we had to talk a while back about uh, the path from DBA to SRE. So, you know, you, you got started out with databases because of an elective in college. And then that led to, you know, encrypted information on a CD-ROM about medical records. But as you've seen this, you know, when you started, did you feel that this was something that was going to be, you know, part of your, your stack or in your tool belt? Um, that this, like I said, that this role that we're kind of moving into, um, now folks are some, some are calling themselves database uh, reliability engineers. What do you think about that? Has it surprised you in any way that, you know, observability is becoming part and parcel for folks that are working with Postgres and SQL? And what can you expect in the future as that role grows? Yeah. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll date myself for this, but I, I remember early in my career ordering parts from Dell and having a, you know, a 3U unit come in and, and plugging in the disks and setting up the OS and setting up RAID and all of that and having like a bespoke database machine. And, you know, then we get to uh, the cloud and you know, DB um, database as a service like RDS and that sort of thing. And now moving on into, to, um, you know, running databases on, Kubernetes and stuff like that. So a lot of that, a lot of the grunt work has been commoditized. And so the real value for DBAs uh, is in observability. You know, uh, I'm not going to, I'll probably never go put some hard drives in a RAID slot and set up RAID again. But I definitely want to know when there's a disk failure, you know, now. Um, so I think um dbas have to be a lot more like sres and um it, you know i think tracing while I, I don't know of any database that emits traces itself frequently as a dba i've wanted to know who is calling this database um, mm -hmm. what what services depend on this database what code is is being executed against the database. And so tracing can be a tool for a, D, a DBA in that. Um, you know, and, and with PromScale, we're gonna, we've, we already support metrics. We in, from Prometheus, we're gonna be adding support for open telemetry metrics and open telemetry logs. And so I also think as a DBA, using a tool like PromScale, where all of these metrics land in a SQL database together side by side is incredibly powerful because you can use your, your skills in SQL to correlate these data, um, right? Instead of like looking at traces in Jaeger and metrics in Grafana or Prom, uh, Prometheus and logs and, you know, something else, but, you know, it's really hard to jump from system to system and try to figure out a complete picture. And so, um, yeah, putting all these in a SQL database, um, unlocks a whole lot of power. Hopefully that answered your question. No, that's good. That's good. No, I like that you're saying that the role, the role is evolving and that these notions of transparency, of, well, who's querying it? And, you know, where's, why is this, where is this coming from? The, the more accurate the information we have, the better we can make decisions and, and know better if we're, if we're completing, you know, in the SRE sense, you know, SLAs, SLOs, SLIs, um, that when that kind of stuff, we're very much client side focused and making sure that we're providing the service that, that we said we we're going to provide. We've got a question um, from Michael. Um, so with what you have shown us, why do we need Jaeger? Hmm. Good question. I'm not sure you do. Uh, you could build the UI that Jaeger has in Grafana. Um, obviously, Jaeger supports other backends. So, you know, to, to do this the way I've done it, you, you need a SQL database, right? And that may not be what your organization chooses to use. Um, but see, yeah, certainly if you've got the data in a SQL database, uh, yeah, the, the sky's the limit. You, you know, as long as you can write the query, you can uh, throw it in a Grafana dashboard. I don't know that you need Jaeger at that point. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not a Jaeger expert either. So maybe there are some features in there that I'm, I'm missing, but um, no, yeah, that's my... That's a, no, that's fine. And, and, and you don't need to be an expert on it, but it, <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, good question there. 
I guess now taking over to the Kubernetes side, you know, one of the things we talk about in just about all of our live streams is, you know, is um, what, why, why should folks be considering to, you know, running their databases, uh, stateful workloads on Kubernetes, the benefits that you see, and, and based on that, what can organizations do to, to get ready for that change that we, that many see coming? Yeah. So full disclosure, I've never run a database on Kubernetes. I've seen it done. Uh, you know, we do it at time scale. Um, and I've always, always been in the past hesitant to do so uh, just because I knew, you know, you, you, you go read about Kubernetes and, you know, uh, it, it seems like it was designed for stateless stuff, right? And so there's always this, like, I think the best DBAs are sort of um, wary of new stuff because we are dealing with state and it's so important that we don't lose production data. But having said that, uh, all I hear about is, you know, all these new operators coming out and people moving their stateful workloads to Kubernetes. And so I think certainly it's maturing. And the fact that we have these operators um, will give you a sense that, you know, uh, especially the open source ones, that um, it's been, it's, it's, it's maturing and it's bulletproof. Um, I think it's also going to be more powerful than the database as a service in some ways, because, you know, you, you go use like RDS. Uh, there's only a certain number of things you can do with it. You know, it's whatever Amazon decided to do. And, and it's all done the way they decided to do it. And you don't even necessarily have a whole lot of insight into what's happening when you push the button. Right. Um, and so I think uh, Kubernetes you know, it's not not only going to unlock efficiencies where you can run more um, stateful apps on less hardware, but also give you more uh, insight and flexibility into how you run them. Got it. I, I first of all, I appreciate your transparency and honesty. And <laughs> and the thing is, but that's helpful because this gets us out in the open as to why there is reluctance, why there is some uncertainty. And and let's face it, you know, when Kubernetes was originally designed was designed precisely with what you said, with stateless workloads in mind and not with stateful ones. And so what we are seeing though is more and more, like you said, the operator pattern, which is encouraging for a lot of folks, depending on what kind of database they might be using and then having to decide uh, which operator to, to, to go for or if they're gonna build their own operator. The open source ones obviously that we've seen in our community have, um, have been helping out a lot. And it seems that for the time being, that seems to be the primary way to be working with data on Kubernetes. We, we often talk about, you know, what we might be able to expect in the future. Will there be the operator to, to rule all operators? We don't know, um, but we'll probably be finding out because this is the place where these conversations happen. Yeah, um, maybe maybe the operator framework, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> even among relational databases, like they, they, they are so different, even if they're using the same techniques, they're, they're complex beasts with lots of parts and lots of knobs to tweak. And so I find it hard to believe that you'll have one operator that knows how to run any kind of database well, or all databases well. But, um, you know, maybe, um, maybe pieces of operators. Maybe there's operator plugins for open telemetry that you'll plug into your database one day and it spits out metrics and stuff. I don't know. It could um, be. It could be, be interesting. We, you, we, we got to this. We're having this conversation because of an elective that you took in college. So nothing can <laughs> right. be built down. And I'm not even <laughs> going to talk about how I got here. So because it wasn't, it wasn't because of an elective in college. Uh, that's another story for another day. Can you stop sharing your screen really quickly so I can share mine? Just we're getting towards the end, um, folks. Just as a reminder, if you want to continue the conversation with um, with amazing practitioners like John. I dropped a link to our Slack. You can jump in. We have a very friendly uh, atmosphere. You can ask questions. You can get them answered. You can share resources. We do have a tradition in the data on Kubernetes community that while John was talking, we had uh, giving a great presentation. We had our artistic, uh, we can call him creative director, Angel, who's in the background drawing, um, doing a live drawing of the different things that were covered in John's talk. Um, obviously, there were a lot of things covered, but I think this is a good synopsis. Um, so this is a nice way to visually represent the things that were being shown. Also very nice, I got to say about John Stock too, dashboards. I love a good dashboard where we get to see these things and, and it brings it to life because sometimes it can be it can be complex to extract the insights. 
these dashboards make it much easier. And once again, helping out um, so people can make better decisions. That being said, John, thank you very much for joining us today. We'll be having another live stream tomorrow. Like I said, talking about the business side of data on Kubernetes. We'll also be doing an Ask Me Anything session with Rick Vasquez on Friday. Um, so plenty of things always going on and look forward to having more folks from Timescale with us. You are hiring, I believe, right, John? Yes, we are. Come check out our page. Any particular roles <laughs> we should know about? Uh, if you want to work the with me <laughs> on, on SQL like this, uh, I'm, you know, I need some help. Come join. I think it's, I think it's pretty cool too, that, you know, going full circle on that. You saw Matt's talk, uh, you know, Matt, who's also a time scale and that was a source of inspiration. And hopefully this talk can also be a source of inspiration. So people get a direct idea of, you know, the kind of stuff that you're working on. Um, so anyway, looking forward to more conversations. Thank you very much for your time, John. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Take care. Have a good one. Bye, everybody. You too.